I'm reading tonight from 1 Kings chapter 18. There is only one verse that we actually require to get us to the point of the sermon for this occasion, and that one will be verse 21. Here's what the Bible says. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. I've entitled our study for this occasion, Decision. Decisions. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the truth that is in the word of God. Now as we open thy word, we pray for power that is beyond ourselves. For these are troubled times. And in times like these, we need to hear the voice of our God. So we have not come now to hear opinions from humankind. We have come now to hear truth from heaven. Give it to us, Father, and our souls shall be satisfied. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. We come to this discussion because of our theme. If God be for us, who can be against us? I will tell you that I believe from the very fiber of my being from the core of who I am that if you are on God's side and if God is on your side there is no power on the face of the earth that can overcome you and tonight as we look in this experience you will see one man standing in the power of God against everything that can be arrayed against him and he will make it because God is with him. In times like these, we must understand because uh, there seem to be powers arrayed against us. Every demographic in society can claim it. There, there are people who don't like you. There are systems that seem to be canted against you. There are problems that rise up to face you and everybody seems to have some challenge that is unanswerable. But the fact is that even now, God is able, and if you are on God's side, God on your side, there is no problem that can overcome you. Watch as Elijah shows you that if you've got faith in God, then God will never let you down. The fact is that Warnings had already gone to the house of Ahab. Ahab's wife is Jezebel. I do not intend to seem sexist when I say that Jezebel's name gives me shivers because the fact is that Jezebel is married to Ahab and something happens when you get married. If you are not alike when you get married, you will be alike pretty soon. Think about it before you get married. <laughs> Jezebel's name has the ring, but Ahab is evidently too weak, or he perhaps is the same as she is, so that this family that should be standing for God is instead encouraging worship of Baal. Those very leaders who should have been saying, stand for God, Jehovah, are instead bringing the priests of Baal, 450, the prophets of Baal, 450, and the priests of Baal, 400, taking care of them so that the nation is not encouraged now to stand for God. The nation is pushed towards idolatry. And the question comes, how will you decide? Where will you be? Which side will you be on? Some of them, say the scholars, were inclined to straddle the fence. Now that's not new. There are always people who want to be on both sides. They want to be on God's side just in case. And they want to be with everybody else just in case. 
So they either go from one side to the other or they hide one side when it's appropriate and hide the other. But the fact is that at some point in your life, you've got to come to the decision that you either for God or against him. God does not share well. If your heart belongs to God, he is not inclined to share your heart. He wants all of it because he gives you all of him. And so there are people who have played back and forth, just as some of these folk did. The, the setting is interesting. In the natural world, there were some events that made people perhaps want to go for Baal. Uh, some of the historians say that Baal, uh, one of the, the most intimate gods of Canaanite society, was the one who brought rain. Baal was allegedly, according to the mythology, killed by his enemy. But then when he was resurrected in the spring or perhaps the fall, the rains would come. So the folk would pray to Baal for the rain to come. Now, the fact is that God is the one who gives rain. But there is a slight controversy possible. If you uh, study the Bible, you will discover in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 that God has given Satan a limited power over the elements. The prince of the power of the air, he's called. Now, when I am flying, I rehearse that text to myself. And I also rehearse another text. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So evidently this power that Satan has as the prince of the power of the air is not a permanent exclusive power. It's limited and temporary. So when I'm flying, I'm always talking to God saying, Lord, let him have all that other space. But the space that I'm flying in, would you take it over, please? The fact is that while the devil may have been able to accomplish through Baal some kind of rain that came at seasons, God in fact has the power and the control of the earth and only gives a little away temporarily. In fact, if you would read in Matthew, you will discover in chapter 5 and verse 45 that God allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. That doesn't even sound like the devil. So God does in fact take back control of the rain. But all through Deuteronomy, it's interesting that it's back there. Deuteronomy would, would have us to believe that when God gets disturbed at people and their disobedience, that one of the things that God can do is to hold back the rain. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 23 God says if you disobey me I'll make the sky like brass and the ground like iron that means nothing will get through the rain falls from the top the dew rises from the bottom but if you disobey me I'll cut them both off and there'll be nothing and then you read in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 16 that God can shut up heaven so watch what God does. God says, oh, you think it's Baal who brings rain? Well, then I'll turn it off and see if you can get Baal to turn it back on. <laughs> and so because of the recalcitrance of the house of Ahab, God calls this Elijah from his mountain retreat and says, go now travel down to the palace of Ahab. And when you get there, tell him that it won't rain for three years. Now let me explain something about what God does when he commands things. God sometimes commands things that don't make sense. To you. God doesn't have to make sense 
Because God made sense. God doesn't have to be logical. God made logic. If he chooses, he can go beyond what is logical. He can do things that are illogical. He can make things heavy light or things light heavy. Mm? Make feathers fall and elephants float. If it serves his purposes. So God tells a prophet, travel through the well-watered lands into Samaria. While Elijah is traveling, he's looking at the brooks running over, gurgling with water. He's looking at the trees that are filled with leaves. He's looking at plants that are flourishing. He sees no sign at all that there will be a drought. But God told him to go deliver a message and he walks past the plants that are well watered going to tell the king that there'll be no more rain. See, when God tells you to do something, don't wait until it gets logical. Just do it. <laughs> Just do what God says. So now he passes, gets somehow into the palace of Ahab, past the gods that must have been there. He did not stop for statecraft, did not have any introduction that we can read. Evidently was not summoned, did not write letters. There was nothing exchanged on the level that you would expect it to be because when God makes an appointment, all you got to do is keep it. So now he's there. He appears in the palace and says to Ahab, it will not rain for three years. And before Ahab can think to react, the prophet is gone. After you've done what God says, you don't have to hang around for socializing. The job is done. And now this man finds himself hated for telling the truth. Oh, you mean that was happening way back then? <laughs> the Bible says, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Some folk think that when you get right, everything gets right. Well, because Satan has that limited control, then sometimes when you are living closest to God, you have the most problems in your experience. Beware when all men speak well. Beware when things are going too well because if you represent Jesus, the people who hate Jesus will hate you. If the people who hate Jesus love you, something is wrong with this picture. <laughs> so when you get close to the Lord, Somebody ought to get rattled. You ought to make a wave somewhere. You ought to appear on somebody's radar screen. Somebody ought to frown when you come around if you're like Jesus. Because you can read it if you want to. Some of us read selectively in the Bible and we want to think that wherever Jesus was, it was peaceful. And he meandered over the undulating hills and meadows. But if you keep on reading, you will find Jesus coming to situations that are charged with hatred. Because if you stand for something, somebody will dislike you. So now the man of God has done what God told him, and now everybody gets angry. This doesn't make sense. When the sin of a nation rises to the level that it causes God to turn the water off. Should you get mad at the one who came to announce it? Or should you be disturbed at the sin that caused it? The fact is that these people should have understood that some trials come to wake you up. Some problems come to give you a wake up call. Some things happen in your life, God allows them so that you can see yourself. Trials are not to tell God about you. God already knows about you. Trials are to tell you about you. But instead of getting angry at the sin and the sinners, 
instead of turning to God and, and calling on him for mercy, they turn instead on the man who came and made the announcement and they begin to search for him and try to find him so that they can take his life as though taking his life would change what God decided. It's ridiculous. You can kill all the preachers and God will still be God. In fact, the one thing I love about this book is that the book does not care who reads it. The Bible says the same thing to the high and to the low. If you got every credit card available, it says the same thing to you. If you couldn't get a credit card on your best day, it says the same thing to you. Huh? If you drive a used car that's so old, the name has dropped off, it says the same thing to you. Or if you drive a car that's recognizable anywhere, says the same thing. The Bible does not change because of who you are. It does not cut corners because of your socioeconomic condition. It's plain. So truth does not change because you get angry at the bearer of truth. The Bible doesn't change. God does not change because you get angry at some preacher. In fact, I've kind of made it my rule. If I don't get somebody upset, what's the use in preaching? You ought to cause a little ripple. Something ought to happen. I do not preach to disturb folk. But if you tell it like it is, somebody ought to get a little worried. It just ought to be. So now they are angry at Elijah. Now that should not have been the response. In fact, I challenge you. There's a text that we read all the time in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And that should be your response. Now most of us don't read verse 13. We read verse 14. And in fact, let me read verse 14 because you'll love it. You know it. You'll probably be able to say it with me. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know that one. Look at verse 13. It's amazing. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. Part of the problem that leads to repentance, God says, if you go against my will, one of the things that I have an option to do is to shut up the rain. Turn it off. Turn it off. And if you come to me with a humble heart, and if you confess your sin, then I will hear from heaven and I'll heal your land. So what Israel should have done was to pray. But instead Ahab said, the problem is that preacher. Where is he? <laughs> Had people out looking for the preacher. If you want to hide, let God hide you. God made a little place for Elijah down by the brook Cherith and fed him there by raven. Now you know that's interesting. Somebody's in here tonight trying to figure out where your breakfast is going to come from. <clears throat> trying to know how you're going to eat, how you're going to make a way for yourself. God can make a way out of no way. I am not certain that I would choose to be fed by a bird, but if I got hungry enough, I'd take it from a bird. Huh? I read a story the other day about a man who got hungry and a cat brought him bread. Now, I think I'd have to be pretty hard pressed to eat bread delivered by a cat. The only way the cat can deliver the bread is in the cat's mouth. And if I had to pick up the bread with little teeth marks in it, I'd have to think a long time, but hunger would eventually overcome my predilection for food that had not been offered to cats. And I would be excited to get the bread. What I'm trying to tell you is that God can make a way out of nowhere. If, if God be for you, who can be against you? Do you see it? 
Then when, when the, the brook dried up, because remember God said, I'm going to turn off the rain. And when the rain gets turned off, eventually everything dries up. Then God sent him over to the, the coast of Phoenicia. And there he came to the widow of Zarephath. I love the story. Little widow is out in this drought feeding her child and, and gathering up sticks to make the last cake of bread. In fact, the cake of bread sounds like something we used to eat in the housing project where I grew up. Some of you folk are too wealthy to understand this, but let me, let me acculturate you. There was a time long ago before microwave cooking. When things got hard, when things got tough, you could get a little meal, a little oil, and one of those big, ugly frying pans. You know, big black frying pan. And put that thing in there and let it sizzle a little bit. And you know, when you get down that far, it doesn't take much to get you excited. I can remember when my mother would do that and I knew times were rough, but you know, we'd stand around and watch that thing. <laughs> Mom, is it ready yet? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the lady got her last little cake, her little boy, and the sticks gathered, and she says, I go, we're going to eat one more meal, and we're dead. And the preacher shows up. Come on now, let's, let's get real here. And the preacher shows up and says, if you give me the last cake, then the Lord will make a way for you. Now you know you talk about us preachers all the time about that kind of thing. If you let me ride, the Lord will let you ride. If you take care of me first, the Lord will then take care of you. And folk talk about that all over the place. What in the world is wrong with these preachers? They think you're supposed to take care of them first. Well, I don't know about now, but this is in the Bible, folks. I don't know. I'm, you, you figure it out for yourself. But the man of God comes and says, look, you give me something to eat, the Lord take care of now, the lady must have been dedicated to God because only God, listen, the, the question is, would you take care of your child? God requires that you take care of your child. But now God requires a new priority. <laughs> I believe that when God talks to your heart, there are times when God will require of you something that is not traditional. All you got to do is make sure it was God. <laughs> huh? I don't know. We, we read nothing about what the little boy says. I remember one time a preacher came to our home, and uh, my brother and I were about to eat some ice cream. And this preacher had read something recently that said, that there was a certain element in ice cream that was unhealthy. And he and my father had a long discussion. And he said, the only way to find out whether it's in the ice cream or not is to melt it. <laughs> if you think about it, once ice cream has been melted, it's no longer ice cream. It's something disgusting. My brother and I looked at each other without a word. But our hope was that our father would say no. Our father said yes. And we sat there and watched our ice cream. <laughs> Melting because of a preacher. Can you imagine what we thought of that preacher? <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> but here... What did the little boy think? We never read that he objected. Evidently, there must have been some training that occurred before this event because the little boy never says, Mom, you, what? You give him your half. 
let me and the preacher eat, you have faith. This child must have been trained. Amen. The woman says, take it. And, and you, you've read it. After that, every time the lady would go back, she'd find a little more meal in the meal container and a little more oil in the oil container. I like the way God did that. See, some of us want a full supply. When God gives me something, give it all. You know, God, if you can't give me a Lexus, give me nothing. I like the way God did that. See, some of us want a full supply. When God gives me something, give it all. You know, God, if you can't give me a Lexus, give me nothing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'll take a Toyota. Same car anyway. <laughs> Few bells and whistles here and there. Same car. But some of us want it all. The fact is that sometimes God brings blessings in increments. So you learn how to trust him every day. But watch this. God hides Elijah so that Ahab can't find him. Feeds him by a raven. Then by a widow. And God keeps him separate and aside so that nobody can harm him. I believe that if you stand for what's right, that God will protect you. You may have hardship. Nobody, nobody believes that Elijah enjoyed necessarily this beyond measure. I don't know about you, I'd kind of enjoy God delivering me food by a river. See? Sometimes it's not what you're eating, but how God delivers it. But, but the, he did not deliver food that was exorbitantly expensive. These were the bare necessities, but it was God feeding his prophets. And there is a miracle in that that is perhaps greater than the quality or the taste of the food. God delivering, God making a place. And my friends, I tell you, that in this year that seems so far removed from that, the same God, the same God, if you trust in him, will still stand for you. So now we have the man of God hidden and no rain. Think about it. The rain is not coming. The people are praying to Baal. But God wants them to see it's not Baal who brings rain. If you think he can, keep praying to him. Let him be resurrected in your mythology. But there will be no rain. Then there were those who for political correctness believed in Baal. Since the king and queen trusted in Baal, they said, well, I don't really believe in Baal. But in order to get a little favor with the powers that be, I will believe too. Now, you know, those are the folk who disturb me most. You're not doing what you really believe. You're just trying to be accepted. Shame, shame on ya. you. Know, I, I, I don't really, see, I have this little thing here, this little trinket, but I don't really believe. It, it's just that, you know, in our society, uh, Ahab and Jezebel believe in, in Baal. So I kind of, you know, just, it's a cultural thing. You know, I don't really believe in it, please. I'm not into it, but I just kind of keep it around in case somebody would have come by. You never know. And I believe that, that we as God's children ought to try as best we can to get along with people. You know, we, we don't want to seem strange. So we kind of blame friends of mine, when, when it comes to doing wrong, forget political correctness. So these folk are calling on Baal, or maybe somebody secretly calling on Baal, or maybe somebody calling on God for a while, and then Baal for a while. But whatever they're doing in their strange little mixed up lives, there is no rain. Ahab is looking for Elijah, but can't find him. Now God says, after the three years 
have passed. Go tell Ahab it's going to rain. Now watch this. The same prophet who went with the brooks flowing, overflowing, with the trees full of leaves to say the rain will stop, now travels through a barren land to say it's going to rain. So the same topography that was verdant before is barren now. It looks like fire has scorched the earth. Trees look like skeletons, they are so bare. But now the prophet goes to find the man who would take his life and goes to Obadiah, the keeper of the palace. Now let me take a little look with you at this man Obadiah. This must have been one who believed that if God be for you, nobody can be against you. Because while he was the keeper of the palace, when Jezebel started killing the priests of God Jehovah, he hid a hundred of those priests, 50 in one cave, 50 in another, at the risk of his own life so that he could keep God's priests alive. Now that's a man. See, if you want to prove who you are, it's not in these little peripheral matters. It's who can stand for what they believe. This man knows that here he is keeping the palace. Ahab is right there every day. And still he stands and hides the priests of Jehovah. So now when, when Elijah shows up, he, he finds Obadiah. And they're out looking for water. <laughs> Isn't that something? You're a king, but you can't command water. <laughs> Powerful, but you can't command water. Only God can command water. So we have this out with Obadiah. He says, Obadiah, you go that way. I'll go this way and let's look for some water. While Obadiah is out there looking, Elijah shows up. Says, How you doing, Obadiah? How are you? Go tell Ahab I want to talk to him. Well, you know that, that's some power. <laughs> you know, they've been looking at, looking for you, trying to kill you. And he goes, tell him I'm here. <laughs> if God be for you. <laughs> he said, well, if I go tell him you're here, God is so powerful, he'll make you disappear while I'm gone. Then when I come back with him and you're gone, he'll kill me. No, don't worry about it. Tell him, come on. So here comes Ahab with all of his pomp and circumstance. Because he's scared. Now think about it. Man got an army. Man's got all this power. All of these trappings of power. But the only real power is God. So now he comes with his army. Think about it. A king with an army coming to meet a prophet in the woods where they were looking for water and comes to him now and Elijah says to him, brings him a message, but before the words can escape his mouth, Ahab says, are, are you he that troubles Israel? <laughs> Trying to conjure up a little courage. Now you would think that Elijah might have tried to ameliorate the king's anger. You know how you do and I do sometimes. Well, let's, let's not speak harsh words. You know, he could have said, how are you, King Ahab? It's, we're, we're very sorry for the things that have had to happen. But when you, when you speak for God, you don't have to put the sugar coat on it. <laughs> you don't have to try to be mean, but you can go ahead and talk. He says, are you the one who troubles Israel? He says, no, you in your father's house because you disobeyed. You're the trouble. Huh? I came to tell you that there's going to be rain. Get your priests and your prophets together and meet me on Carmel. The little lonely prophet speaking like a king and the king speaking like a God forsaken nobody. If God is on your side, you can have more power than those who have apparent power. 
because God's power is transcendent. So now Ahab goes back with all his army. Jezebel, we got to meet Ahab. <laughs> I wish I could have been there when he got to tell Jezebel that. <laughs> who? You met who? Said we got to meet, get all the prophets together, and get all the priests together, and let's, we got to go up on Carmel now. And all of Israel, those who have turned their backs on the God of heaven, 450 prophets and 400 priests stand with Ahab in front of them. A king with all of his power and all of his army, his armed men. And they all stand on Mount Carmel. And one man stands alone and commands them. And you're sitting up here worried about your job. Why don't you let God handle it? Why don't you let your life be faithful to God and let him take care of it? If God lets you lose that job, it's because he's got another one. Huh? God owns Big Blue. God owns General Motors. God owns the Stock Exchange. He's got Dow Jones and the Nikkei. He owns them all. Sometimes he allows lapses to come in our lives so that we learn how to have better quality prayer. But God is able to make a way out of nowhere. He can hide you from your enemies until he gets ready. And then he gives you power to stand if you must stand alone. One plus God is a majority. So now, Elijah stands and says, how long will you be indecisive? How long will you lean towards Baal so that you can curry favor with this king? Why don't you stand on God's side? But because the people had nothing to say in their own defense, but they were not willing to say that they were wrong, they just stood there. And the silence was deafening. Now Elijah says, let us choose bullocks and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. Now think about it, this, this, this isn't following a normal pattern. He should have said the God who answers by rain. Remember, what they're looking for is rain. They're not looking for fire. The last thing you want in the middle of a drought <laughs> is fire but God will answer as he chooses. For God is a God of light. You can look all the way through the Bible and you find the symbol of light, the Shekinah glory, the pillar of fire that followed Israel. God is a God of light. And fire is a part of the sacrificial system that represents his decline towards man. His love for man is shown in the system of sacrifice that brings fire. And so he says, prepare a sacrifice. You folk have sacrifices for Baal, choose a bullock. You have sacrifices for him, you, you get ready and let him bring fire if your God is so great. And let me tell you something, the greatness of the God of heaven is amazing because while God is so great that he can do anything, he is omnipotent, yet God cares enough about human beings that from time to time he will display his power in a way that you and I can tell that the only God is God Jehovah, the God who rules heaven and earth. In fact, God does not have to prove anything to us. God did not have to come down on Carmel to show who he was. He would have still been God had he not come. But he came to show us, to show Israel who he was. In fact, when Elijah declared it, he said he will show you, he will show you that he is God of Israel. And then when he prayed his prayer, you remember he said God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He went through those promised, those promised loved ones who had been their progenitors. It was God's promise to Abraham, to Isaac, then to Jacob. 
And he went back through the promises to prove that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. God is the God of Israel. God is the God of this people. God deigns to come down and to interface with humankind. So take a bullock, and I'll take one, and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And the folks with Baal did what he told them. Took a bullock, cut the bullock, put him on the altar, started screaming and streaking and cutting themselves. And I could stretch it out for dramatic sake, but I don't need to. Because the fact is that all day long with all the noise and the cutting and the shrieking and the gymnastics, nothing. Think about it. If you were a priest of Baal, wouldn't you have tried to start a fire? <laughs> Tell me there wasn't some priest somewhere. They all need a little help. <laughs> One of my favorite writers says that while Elijah was a man of faith, he was also a man who understood human nature. So he did not go away while they were doing their strange acrobatics. He kept an eye on them. Huh? Excuse me, what, what's happening over here? Because <laughs> the devil would have loved for some fire. In fact, that same writer suggests that if the devil himself could have got some lightning, remember prince of the power of the air? If the devil could have... <laughs> but while Elijah was watching, God's angels. Huh? Do you believe this? I believe in the power of God. I believe when God's angels set their watch, nothing can penetrate. So the devil may have had a thunderstorm somewhere, but he wasn't going to have one here. One of them may have come close, got a little cloud trying to move. God's angel, not here, not today, not now. We, we kind of got a little special something happening up here. We're going to let Baal bring the fire on this mountain. And if he can't bring it, you can't either. So there's no fire. I suggest to you that God is not only great for what he does, but for what he prevents. And at the end of the day, when all of their feverish efforts were exhausted and when they were cut and hoarse and mangled and frustrated and tired beyond belief, Elijah says, come near Israel. And watch what happens now. Took up those stones, 12 of them for the 12 tribes of Israel. Put them back, altars that had been torn down, that needed to be built back. Cut the animal for a sacrifice to the God of heaven. Then did something strange. After the wood had been in place, Bring a little water. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not supposed to bring water when there's going to be a fire. But if you are God, you can do it if you choose. The reason why God has to do things in a miraculous way is because if he continued always to do them in a normal way, you and I would never give him credit. If he always let your cousin come through with the loan, you would always give your cousin the credit. So sometimes God pours water on your cousin's bank account at the same time he pours water on yours. So that when the blessing comes, it will not come through a normal way. It will come in a super normal way and you will know that it was God.
who did it. So now they pour four barrels of water once, four barrels of water twice, four barrels of water three times, 12 barrels of water. The water gushes over and runs into the trenches. And the people who are now resting up from their day-long struggle to bring Baal must have said, good, this will never happen. But one man on one mountain with one God looks toward heaven. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Prove that I am obedient to you. Here I stand alone against thousands. But for the people who live now, for the people who will live then, for people who are worried about their future, way down in the future, answer now. And as soon as the amen was said in another language, fire not only came down from heaven, but fire poured down, according to one commentator, so that it not only showed that it was there, but it showed the trail of where it came from. So fire pours down so that you can see that not only is it fire that touches the mountain, but it's fire that came from God and it burns up the sacrifice, and it burns up the wood, and it burns up the stone, and it burns up the water, and it laps up the very earth around. And it is proven now that it's time to stop hovering in between and make up your mind. And in this new postmodern era, there are some people who think that information is everything. I am on the internet. I, I was on the today and I, I'm there browsing the internet. A friend of mine, the internet is yellow pages with pictures. When you get off the information superhighway, a broken heart will still be broken. A lonely inside will still not be filled. And unless you meet the power of God somewhere on the internet, you'll be the same one when you sign off as you were when you signed on. There is no power in the modem. There is no power on the internet unless you meet God there. If God be for you, who can be against you? The challenge is simple. Will you hedge your bet Will you lean a little bit on the world and a little bit on God? A little bit of Baal and a little bit of God, Jehovah. Because those who halt between two opinions live their lives out in foolish confusion. Make up your mind. Can God be trusted? That's the question. Elijah says, let me show you something. I stood alone. In fact, when you read the story of the transfiguration, I love it because there on that mount, you remember that there was Jesus praying, Lord, let them see me. Let them see me as I was. And all of a sudden there were with him, those two, Moses and Elijah. I believe that the reason why God allowed Elijah to come down and meet with Jesus on that mount is because on another mount, Elijah had proven for all the world that if God is on your side, you don't need anybody else. And so Jesus, facing the ultimate test, might have been encouraged there by the words of one who stood on Carmel all alone. There was Jesus about to go to Mount Calvary, and there was Elijah saying, I was on Mount Carmel. And I'll tell you this, that if you take everything you've got and trust it in God's hands, he'll never fail you. Now, the other side of that must be understood. Some of us want God to give us everything, but we don't want to give him all that we have. 
We say, God, I need, I need, I want, I want. Our prayers are like laundry lists. What if your prayer could be a dedication? Father, all that I have, all that I am, I give to you. I put my life in your hands. I trust the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And if I have to stand alone, let me stand by myself. I don't know what your trial may be tonight, but I tell you this, that if you can trust God with all you have, God will give you all he has. And it is an unequal bargain. For what God has supersedes what you have by proportions that are beyond your imagination. If God puts everything he has on the table and you put everything you have on the table, you can't lose because God has much more than you will ever have. So what I want to say to you, why, why don't you stop with the indecision? Recognize that it takes everything to really serve the Lord. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face. 